Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us. All righty, there we go. Excellent, all right. So, hello everyone and thank you very much for joining this webinar today. It's a real pleasure to uh, have you online. Uh, this is a first for me, so um, please forgive any, uh, any mistakes that I might make. Um, but always looking forward to feedback and input. So at any time uh, afterwards, if you'd like to send me an email, I'd love to hear your thoughts. All right. Um, the idea with this webinar is that um, not only am I going to go over some general information and some of my thoughts, but uh, the idea is that it's very interactive. Uh, and so I encourage you to ask questions and feel free to ask anything. If I can't answer it, I will say so. <laughs> but uh, please, please uh, do put your questions into the uh, Q&A uh, box, which uh, should be on your screen as you mouse over it. Um, and what will happen is we'll go through those at the end, OK? Um, presentation should be no longer than 30 minutes. And then after that, we'll do questions and answers. All right? All right. So thank you again. Going. All right, so um, basically what I'm going to be just touching base on is I'm going to be going over Cayman and uh, obviously COVID and uh, obviously some of the impacts related to that and how we've fended um, through this very, very uh, tribulatious time. Um, like the rest of the world, obviously it's something that we're all going through at the same time together. So we can all very much relate to each other in many aspects of it. Um, the other thing I wanted to go over was just to go over some of the numbers. Uh, these numbers are all going to be Cereba numbers. And so it doesn't necessarily have 100% of the market, but it gives you a really good indication of what's going on uh, and the activity that's uh, within the marketplace. All right. And I'm also going to talk about King's uh, future as far as the market's concerned. And uh, after that, obviously, we'll go into the questions and answers, as I mentioned earlier. All right, so Cayman's response to COVID. Um, like everywhere else, uh, people went into lockdown. We were actually, I would say, very proactive in this. And as a country, I feel not only did uh, our government and also the people of the Cayman Islands react appropriately, but we were fast to close our borders. We were also fast to go into a lockdown situation. And obviously, we uh, went and immediately implemented uh, social extensive testing, sorry, uh, that has been needed. Um, so I think the way the world sees it is that Cayman has uh, done a very, very good job. Um, and so today we sit here um, where we've got great involvement between the public and also the private sector who are working on a reopening strategy as well to get us back, uh, back to work, but also uh, open to the world. Currently, we're sitting here with 14 days or over 14 days with no new cases. Uh, there are not many places in the world that can actually say that. We're at level two, which is minimal suppression. Um, level one being the all clear, uh, which is obviously where we're work working towards. Um, all our businesses are currently open and back to work. Uh, there are a certain amount of uh, companies that have still allowed staff the ability to uh, work from home if they have that capacity. Um, but at the end of the day, businesses are fully open and fully active. Um, social distancing is still in effect and um, taken quite seriously. Um, and uh, I think this is just something that we're going to end up having to live with, definitely for the foreseeable future. Um, but obviously, uh, COVID is not going to go away. And uh, the goal is to figure out the safest and best way for us to open and be able to go about our business and daily lives. Um, with respect to the ongoing testing, um, you know, we've, uh, we're basically just coming up on 50% of the population here, which is a huge number uh, of tests to have uh, been able to be completed by such a small place. Um, but uh, obviously we have a number of places which are doing those tests. And so those are proven to uh, get through the process as quickly as possible. Um, now, the reopening plans. Uh, obviously, one of the biggest uh, parts to this is actually our tourism industry. 
and <clears throat> and wild um, financial services is obviously the primary uh, industry in the Cayman Islands. The second and very very important is tourism because it employs a lot of people, um, and also it employs a lot of people who might not necessarily be uh, skilled uh, or or um, heavily qualified uh, for other things. So it really caters to um, a lot of other areas uh, within employment, which is really critical to Cayman. Um, this is also part of the benefits of creating our lifestyle for, um, for our visitors, but also for us who remain here, uh, restaurants and all the activities that go along with tourism as well. Anyway, the plan is uh, a targeted initial opening of September the 1st. Um, for our borders, uh, it is planned to be a very soft opening in the sense that uh, private planes, uh, yachts, and also um, scheduled flights that are actually coordinated through the government uh, will also be allowed to uh, come and go from the islands. Um, and so initially that's going to be their, their first stage and as time goes on it's obviously going to open up to the masses. They've not said that uh, uh, anyone is restricted from coming, but they are focusing on a priority of being Caymanians, people who are work permits, people who have residency here, and also people who own property in Cayman. All right. So we are welcoming you to return to Cayman <laughs> and come and experience it at its uh, most quiet uh, time as far as from a tourist perspective. So you have a whole, uh, whole different experience but do come down and, uh, and join us. Um, one of the things with the strategy, because obviously some of the other islands have opened up and uh, are further ahead of us by a couple of months to a degree, but we've also seen some of the reactions that have happened with some of them uh, going back into lockdown or closing their borders again. Um, and I think, you know, Cayman's perspective on this is to kind of wait, watch and learn. So watch what happens with these early birds kind of jumping forward and see the reaction to see how maybe we could do it in a better way as a country um, so that we don't have to go um, opening our borders and then immediately shutting them down because uh, that stop start really creates uh, bigger challenges as well going forward. Um, so it's a, it's a good plan, uh, it's a steady one, um, but ultimately we are gonna be open here um, at some point. The tourism industry in other areas um, as well as moving forward. So what's happening is the Grand Hyatt uh, is in the ground uh, and doing their ground site preparation works uh, to kick off construction in a full capacity. Also the Hilton, that one's rocking along, they've got their crane up and so they're moving forward. Just between those two properties, you're looking at over 400 rooms being added to our tourism product, which is uh, greatly needed, frankly. Um, as we haven't had uh, new hotels in, in quite a while. And so these really bring a whole other activity to, um, to the island, but not just uh, from a tourism and from an activity standpoint, but from a real estate uh, perspective. What we've found historically is after a new hotel opens their doors, you find the following three years, the activity here is, is strong. And this comes because a lot of those hotels um, are obviously brands in particular, and so what they do is they end up marketing directly to their consumer uh, or customer base. And uh, what it means is it drives people to come to Cayman through those channels, which then gives us the opportunity once they're here and experience Cayman and all the wonders of it, uh, to be able to encourage them to purchase property. All right. Uh, also, government have been taking advantage of uh, doing some other um, infrastructure projects. One was the runway extension, which was already scheduled, but obviously now, uh, because of the situation has been accelerated. So uh, it looks like it's all going to be done very, very shortly in the middle of September, uh, which is uh, great. So we're very excited about that. In addition to that, um, as you drive around Cayman, there are a fair number of roadworks that have been going on and improvements that have been done so that there's just better traffic flow um, around the island. So these are critical. And uh, there's some additional plans uh, as well going forward and kind of pushing out a little further east, uh, which is all critical to our future growth. Now, we jump into uh, the marketplace by the numbers. So what you're looking at here, uh, these are the active listings, and we're just doing a comparison between uh, 2019 and 2020. 
On your left, it says transactions. Those are just the units in total. So each listing uh, is, is one effectively transaction. So what you're seeing is last year as an average of any month through the same period, uh, there was uh, 1,484 properties actively listed uh, within the MLS. On the right side, what you have is the volume. So that's the value associated with that inventory. Um, and as you can see, um, as an example, uh, last year, the average was uh, 1.6 billion. This year, it's at 1.79. Um, also, please note on each of these sheets, what you're going to see is you can see this little dotted line that runs through uh, March there of this year. And then it's shaded all the way down to another dotted line. Um, anyway, that is actually our lockdown period uh, where our industry was effectively uh, closed and uh, obviously reopened uh, just in the beginning of, uh, of June. All right. So please, you'll see that on each of the slides. Uh, it, it's just to kind of give you a bearing of kind of what's happened with the numbers. All right. So year over year, you're looking at 3% up in inventory uh, to last year. And uh, as far as the value of those properties, we're up by 8.5%. So obviously, the average property value has, has, uh, that's being put onto the market is at a higher price than last year. Uh, currently, the average across the whole board uh, works out to being uh, $1.172 million as an average uh, property that we have in the MLS system. All right, new listings. Okay, so these are just the properties that they come on in a month. Uh, and so you can see here, how they've uh, been coming on last year, but this year again, uh, blue is last year, um, and the magenta is this year. Um, basically, you can see that it's very, very consistent um, over, over year over year. Um, the, the number of new listings, obviously through COVID, um, is, a, is a little softer, though you did see a spike in, uh, in June which is quite normal because obviously as we opened up, there was a lot more proactiveness um, in, in the marketplace. And so some of the things that might have been listed before weren't because a lot of owners thought there was no point at the end of the day. Um, on the other hand, you have the values. Uh, these values have uh, actually dropped uh, in, in by 14.7% um, over the same period of the year. And where you can really see it is obviously through the COVID period uh, you can really see how the numbers dropped off there. All right, so the average value of a property that came on the market during COVID was greatly reduced, um, even though the activity or the number might have come on. So I'll give you a comparison, look at April, you can see 89 new units, and you can see the value of 39 million, uh, whereas last year was 82 units, and at uh, nearly 100 million in value, all right? Moving on to pending transactions. Um, so what you have is here is you've got uh, obviously all the deals that, uh, when we say pending, we're talking about deals that are fully under contract with a full 10% uh, deposit in place. All the conditions have been satisfied. So it's simply moving from that point when all conditions are satisfied to closing. All right, so this period is a 30 day period, it can be 45 and it can be uh, 60 days. All right, but also keep in mind, you know, things that uh, are pre-construction, those can actually be a lot longer. Um, but uh, so just keep that in mind, <laughs> um, uh, obviously, because they've been built. Um, anyway, if you jump to, again, here, you can see the transactions uh, for this year um, are much higher than last year. We're up by 176% uh, percent. Uh, as to the number of pendings that have gone on contract. You can see January, February, and March, all of those months were multiples higher than last year. You then obviously go into the COVID period, and you can see where we're a little off in April, a little higher in May, and then June, it starts flying again. All right, so the number of properties that went under contract immediately coming out of COVID, um, you can see that there's a reaction that's happening. Um, and some of the other properties would have been ones that were pending conditional that managed to get satisfied. Uh, there were a number of transactions that were lost through that process. Um, there were, uh, we calculated, I think it was uh, probably 100 and, I think it was 132 million in sales 
through that period that were, were effectively lost deals. Um, but what you're seeing is you're seeing other things going under contract in June is a big reaction on the value side. You can see here the values, uh, how it spiked in June in particular, similar in May, April a little off. But again, this year, year over year, up 188%. All right, huge difference to last year. Um, now we go to the solds. All right, so solds 2019, 2020. Uh, on your left side are the unit numbers. So in 2019, at this point in time, and uh, just uh, keep in mind, these are all of the 27th of July. So it's not the end of end of July, right, our, our numbers. These are actually just the June ones, I'm sorry. These are through June. I'm gonna show you July separately. Anyway, 2019 to 20, um, you're looking at a 39% drop in, uh, in unit counts. Uh, if you wanna actually look at the difference between the COVID period, uh, that alone could make up that difference um, of uh, other numbers of transactions sold. And as I mentioned earlier, we did lose a lot of uh, transactions that were under contract and didn't go through. There were a few people who walked away from their deposits, uh, but there were many others that were uh, going through conditional satisfaction and those, uh, those deals didn't uh, end up uh, going all the way through. On the volume side, you can see that though we're down 39.5% on the transactions, we're only off by 26% on the volume. Uh, again, uh, you can see how this is really tied to the COVID period. Um, so I think it all makes sense uh, as to what you're seeing here and really not surprising. Um, and then we go into July. So this is the month of July, but it's only up until the 27th of this month. Okay. And uh, so what we're doing is we're the lower part is actually last year and uh, the uh, row at the top here is for this year. A um, couple of things to really highlight um, are to look at the pending deals for the month of July in both years. And as you can see this year, there are 21 transactions that are pending currently uh, for a total of $14 million. Whereas the last year in July, uh, there was only one transaction pending at this time for $390,000. Uh, and I know that sounds really, really low, um, but uh, we do periodically have these uh, moments where it looks like nothing happens, but then the next month it can spike quite drastically and compensate. Uh, in this instance, we're really just wanting to track July's activity versus um, uh, July this year. You move on to the sold side, uh, and what you're looking at there is, yes, the number of transactions are way off, um, but the volume is in, in proportion is very, very good. Um, you know, you're talking about 40 million for 75 transactions last year versus 25 million for 29 transactions. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, last year's numbers actually run through the whole month of July. Our numbers only run through the 27th. And the reason why I just mentioned that is just, you, know, you can imagine most closings happen at the end of the month. Uh, it's either right at the end of the month or at the very beginning. But more often than not, it's the end of the month. Uh, everything seems to be driven to, to those dates. Um, all in all, uh, I think it looks very promising. So I'm uh, pretty excited about uh, where the market is and how well we've done through COVID. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the future. Um, developments, okay. Currently, all developments uh, that were um, going forward prior are moving forward and are back to work. And uh, coming out of the ground. Uh, during the lockdown period, there were approximately 70 new developments that were approved, um, which also um, means that obviously we've got inventory going forward for the next two to five years. Um, obviously, uh, with our real estate industry, absolutely critical from a revenue standpoint for government. And what you're looking at is that basically there's 1.7 billion in development inventory uh, that uh, was currently in the marketplace as of the date was, I think it was June. Um, and also just to let you know that there is 750 million of it that's actually already sold. So uh, that's quite a feat uh, and it's definitely a, a very positive uh, reaction. There were some very interesting transactions that actually happened through COVID in complete lockdown where there were a few pre-construction sales that happened uh, one really exciting one was one over at Watermark, 
that was done for in excess of $25 million for the penthouse on the north corner. Um, in addition to that, there were two other units sold over there as well. So, um, you know, it's not like uh, things completely went, uh, went dead. There were those who were looking at uh, re-upping or changing, moving. Uh, in most cases, the people and the activity that happened during that period were people who are familiar with Cayman um, versus completely blind and new. We did have some buyers who were completely uh, new to Cayman uh, and uh, were looking for a, a effectively a protective, safe environment. Uh, and so did go and transact on uh, a few properties. Um, the bottom here, I'm talking about pricing. So, you know, pricing, whether it's condos, houses, or land, um, and this is today. Um, what we're seeing is that the condo pricing hasn't, uh, hasn't dwindled. Um, and so the pricing seems to be similar to what it was prior to COVID. And so the marketplace has kind of just continued at the same level and, and pricing. Um, the, the homes, what we found there is that uh, some of the homes, um, especially ones that are a little more in value, so in the multi-million dollars, they've been more flexible in their transactions because ultimately uh, people of, of that ilk have the means to make a commercial decision and if they want to move on, they can. So in some of those instances, there have been some uh, reduction in prices, but then there have been other things that have sold right up there at the list price as well. Um, and also this year, there have been some pretty large transactions in, in the residential home market as well. Um, condos on the beach, this inventory has been very slim for the last couple of years, uh, over the last, uh, I'd say, three and a half years. It's been very, very slim. And so the appreciation and prices that have changed as property comes on the market have generally always been higher. And they've made quite large jumps as well through that period. Um, Land prices, and what we've seen with land is that uh, we've got uh, a lot of activity in more the, the lower end in one respect, and uh, I just mean the price point is just a lower price point. Um, a lot of that uh, is driven by the pension, because obviously with this new money that's been uh, uh, put into the marketplace, people have actually you know, made good decisions and decided to invest in real estate. Uh, there have been some house moves as well, and so it has created a, a nice movement within the marketplace. Land has been one of the ones that's it's been quite active. We've also seen um, other types of land selling, so slightly larger parcels of land or some very big parcels of land that have transacted. And also, they're generally further out as well. And so it's interesting to see that, whether they're land banking for the future or whether that plans to redevelop uh, those sites as uh, time moves forward. Uh, one of the things here I've just put out here is bullet, but it, it's really important to note. Um, when, when buyers come to the marketplace, uh, obviously everything is about price to a degree. And with those prices, people are always trying to negotiate uh, the absolute best price uh, for themselves, which obviously you can understand that. But what I want to caution people when they're looking at the marketplace is that the opportunity isn't just price. And it's not always related to that. So, you know, the fact is that over a period of time, you might not be able to find a property that fits within your parameters. Uh, and what I'm talking about is primarily location, uh, elevation. It could be type of property. Uh, I'll give you an example. There is no industrial land available in Georgetown. I did a search uh, what was it, a month, uh, last month, and there was nothing available. Um, so, you know, you, you've got a situation, so if, uh, if a parcel of land comes up and the price might not be quite as attractive, the fact is the opportunity is that it's available and it might be the one that you want. So uh, when you're looking at properties, you know, they don't stay around and uh, there isn't necessarily something else that's going to come back on the market. So the opportunity is finding the property that you want. Um, okay, so the real estate market, what remained the same? Uh, these are kind of like the primary key things that uh, I think kind of drive Cayman forward um, as far as why to invest in Cayman and why should a foreign national look at Cayman um, to either invest in 
come and have a holiday home, relocate to. Likewise, these are also benefits that we all get to enjoy by living here as well, right? So location, brilliant location. We're one hour, one and a half hour from Miami, right? Uh, or you can go to Jamaica, either way, uh, from hitting Miami, bang, the world opens up to you. You're a one more flight away from where you would like to be. So the location is excellent in that uh, situation. Also, uh, the island has been known for its safety over the years. Uh, it, has, it has always been a very safe and obviously a friendly environment. Caymanians and also the local populace here have always been known for their kin and kind. The example of that is uh, someone coming off a cruise ship or a tourist, uh, you know, asking you know, someone down the street, you know, hey, where's the post office? And you know, they don't just point to the post office, they'll actually go and walk into the post office. And then they'll introduce them to like three family members that work there. And sure enough, 20 minutes later, <laughs> everyone's best friends and <laughs> off they go about their business. Um, but you know, that really instills a lot of, um, a lot of the benefits of Cayman. And, and it's one of our qualities that we definitely need to retain uh, because it is a big why for why people come here. Our stable government, absolutely critical. Um, we have enjoyed a stable government now for decades. Um, obviously, we have politics just like everyone else, and uh, we have one side and the other side, and, and a few others in between. Um, but ultimately, uh, we're definitely a more conservative environment, um, but really, it's more about the stability. So from an investor perspective, uh, it's a good place to be. Uh, communication services. Um, these, we've always been uh, fortunate enough to have good communication uh, services providers uh, within our jurisdiction here. Um, over the years, obviously, we've needed more and more bandwidth. Uh, this continues to be a need for everywhere on the planet. Uh, Cayman is no exception. And obviously, uh, this is being worked on to be rectified so that going forward, uh, there will be uh, just more ease of use. And especially when you start looking at remote working whether it's locally or whether it's internationally. Um, plus also being a, 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 an economy like we are, we deal with a lot of uh, uh, international business and finance and as such need to be able to have very good communication um, globally. The economy, we have no income tax, no capital gains tax, no corporate tax, no death tax. Um, you know, and uh, as far as property goes, we only have the stamp duty, the one time you pay it. And after that, there's nothing due. Um, very important, a lot of uh, niceties there. Obviously, we uh, are based more on a, on, a, on a usage tax basis, which is great because it means you get to pick where you pay your taxes uh, versus being dictated to. Uh, our community, obviously, uh, we are very fortunate because we have uh, one of the high, definitely the highest in the Caribbean, but one of the highest uh, standards of living uh, within the world. Our health services, uh, and the fact that we have multiple hospitals available to um, everyone is uh, a real feat uh, and means that those who are visiting live here um, have the ability to get good health care if needed. Schools, our schools continue to improve. We have more and more investment into the schools, whether it's with the local schools or whether it's with the schools that cater to um, people who are on work permits as well but we offer all different types of education, whether it's uh, the English system, whether it's the American system, or international system. So there are many choices for people to, to utilize their schools. Clean environment. Okay, well, we are very fortunate here where we have very, very clean waters. Our air is obviously wonderfully clean, and also our skies are, are very clear, and uh, we don't uh, enjoy snow. We get to go to snow if we want to, but we don't enjoy it here. <laughs> um, anyway, it just means that people can be out a lot. Um, when you talk about lifestyle, obviously this is the restaurants, this is the community, it's everything you do and how you interact. It's about how our kids uh, are able to make friends uh, culturally, how they can be experienced to different uh, cultures, because obviously Cayman's a huge melting pot. Uh, you know, as an example, my kids went to school and there was 57 countries represented uh, within the school. I mean, this is a very unusual situation, but an absolutely amazing one. 
Um, and so the lifestyle is one of the key elements that I think going forward is absolutely critical for Cayman, whether it's the ultra high net worth or the high net worth people or others who want to choose Cayman as a place to locate to and have their primary base for. Um, there is really very little choice on a global basis, especially when you go and complement this with our tax neutral status uh, as well. So the future. All right, how important is the real estate industry? Well, um, seeing as tourism is not active at the moment, or it's very much in a limited capacity, uh, believe it or not, real estate construction and development is actually normally the third uh, pillar of our, of our um, economy, with uh, obviously financial services being number one with 55%, and then it was tourism, and then real estate development. Right now, absolutely critical. One of the most important things for any country, um, getting out of any form of slowdown, uh, whether it's an economical slowdown or a situation like we're in now, is that the industry that helps pull uh, and creates activity within the marketplace is the real estate industry. And it is absolutely critical that it is one of the first that is open. In a lot of countries, they were still going forward. Uh, it's deemed to be an essential service. And so they didn't stop. They kept on going. Construction and development kept on moving forward. Um, the other thing to note about uh, real estate is that uh, it actually has the highest GDP multiple, um, which is really interesting because uh, I was not aware of that and recently found that out. So at 2.5 2 times is our multiple for our industry. So again, really critical because obviously it means every dollar that goes into it just spreads that much further through the economy and a lot more people benefit from it. All right. Um, overall new impacting factors. Okay, so we've got increased buyers uh, looking to relocate. Now obviously there can be all sorts of reasons, whether it's political, financial, tax neutral status, or whether it's health reasons. Um, but we do have a number of people who have relocated and I see this as continuing to grow because Cayman is that unique place. Um, historically, I would have always said, you know, like it's uh, Cayman's the moniker of the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, I mean, the truth is Cayman is its own entity, its own thing. Um, but uh, uh, people really do uh, seem to be getting to grips with uh, the real benefits of Cayman and why Cayman over any other jurisdictions necessarily. And uh, I see this as continuing to grow a big focus for us, especially when you go and couple it with uh, the remote workplace as well. Um, there's an interesting study here with the global workplace analysis now estimates that 56% of US workforce can hold, uh, hold jobs that are compatible with working remotely. Um, this is a really important factor because ultimately what it means is that um, now, when you think about it, you might be thinking that, you know, hey, I don't have to be at my office, I can work from home, right? The way I look at this is that it means that people can relocate to Cayman. They can work from Cayman, they can have their families here. They can be living this kind of lifestyle in this kind of environment and enjoying the sun uh, and the sea life every day. The children can be running around outside uh, interacting and meeting lots of other people from different walks of life. And um, so I see this as a huge opportunity because these people can choose where to be. They don't have to be just 10 miles away from the workplace working from home. They could be thousands of miles away. Um, and this is a really, really uh, important factor. So I see this as something that more and more people obviously transition to this work. Uh, this type of uh, work environment and then obviously you know you'd live here and you'd work remotely and then if you had meetings and you had to go to London and you had to go to New York or California or whatever you could fly to do that for a couple of days come back and be here with your family for the weekend so really critical um, and also I think people are evaluating how they want to spend their time and how they want to live their lives this is just something that's really evolved and become more and more important um, so, um, now the Cayman effect with respect to this, this is an interesting one because it's something that I think it is uh, very prevalent. I've always talked about um, in development and appreciation, um, following infrastructure as a really good way. So if you want a land bank, just, you know, if you have to kind of map out where the, where the 
where the roads potentially are going to be. And if you go on land bank property along with those types of environments for the future, you know, you're going to end up doing very, very well as infrastructure moves through and uh, brings in accessibility. Um, now I see it as more the fact that why would you, you know, you don't have to go and spend, I'm just going to throw a number out there, let's say a million dollars on a townhouse being in, in kind of the South Sound area, when maybe you could take that million dollars and you could actually get a, a, a nice small place that's on the water out in the East End or on North Side. So I think locally we have choices. I also think that because of the cost of property further out, that more of these developments will open up over there. So it means that it's more affordable for people to go and build a house. So rather than living in a townhome, they could go and live in a, in a house where they actually have a piece of land uh, and the kids can run around and be outside. Um, and so they will be able to work remotely as well. So there's multiple sides to the remote working. And so I think that a lot of uptick, uh, sorry, a lot of upside um, as far as um, what it means to people being able to get into something for less money, but also opening up other areas and ideally also reducing the amount of traffic on the roads as well uh, so that we don't have to have uh, thousands and thousands of feet of tarmac. Um, anyway, so new buyers in the marketplace currently, most interest rates. Uh, so right now is an exceptionally good time for people who are financing to get mortgages. Uh, the banks are lending, which is great as well. Um, and so uh, the marketplace has been quite active in that respect, and I see that continuing. Uh, the pension withdrawals has been another huge impact as well. Uh, a lot of people have gone and bought, you know, kind of depreciating assets in some respects, cars and things like this, but there are a lot of people who have actually invested in property, whether reducing their debt or actually being able to finally get into something because they have just that necessary funds to, to get closed because predominantly the biggest challenge are obviously the closing costs associated with buying a property here in Cayman. Um, and so the pension money has been very, very helpful in that respect. Real estate versus stock or other, obviously, I mean, we're in the real estate industry, so of course we're going to tout real estate as being uh, the place to invest. Um, but uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a stable one. It's one that you can feel, touch, uh, and it doesn't, doesn't go away, doesn't change. Uh, value can sometimes vary, but ultimately you still have a physical asset. So a uh, really great investment, long-term perspective is always good in real estate. Uh, it is rare that someone has uh, been hurt uh, investing in real estate with a long-term perspective as well. All right, new housing considerations. Yes, obviously with everything that's happened and obviously with the COVID experience now, People are looking at how they want to live um, and what is the best environment for them and their families, right? So if they want to be someone who, who wants to work from home and they've decided that you know, they're going to be working from home so they get more time with their kids and their family and that works for them, they might need to have an extra room so they can have the studies and so that they can have a little separation so that the kids aren't necessarily on top of them. And you might have other people who have been in that environment who want to downsize because they just can't handle the fact that the kids are being homeschooled there and all of the other challenges associated with it. And so they really want to kind of escape and, and either go back to the office um, for that and then come home and focus on the family at that stage. Um, I guess the nice thing is that ultimately there's lots of choice, you know, but I do see movement in the marketplace because of this as people can decide on what works for them. So ultimately, Right. Um, what I would say about Cayman's marketplace currently and going forward is that we are really well positioned, uh, I think, to have a very strong market. I think the reaction has been some bent up demand, obviously, from the COVID. And so there's been a reaction to that. The next coming months are going to be really interesting. I personally believe it's going to continue for the various reasons that I, I went over there. Um, I also think that uh, the next big step is actually when, the, uh, when we're able to allow visitors properly into the island and the reaction to that and the activity that comes from that, I think is gonna be another boost to the, uh, to, the, to the real estate industry as a whole, all right? So in closing, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you to these fine people who I'm fortunate enough to work with every day. And so on your right there is Emily, 
and she has been with us now for three years. Um, and uh, to her left is Mabel, and Mabel has uh, put up with me for now 17 years. Um, <laughs> probably needs a sabbatical by now. Um, and then uh, to my right there um, is Crystal, and she's been with us for, for 10 years now as well. So these are big numbers, very loyal, and Nick, uh, recently joined, but has already uh, got two years under his belt, and uh, he works with me on the sales side. Um, but uh, anyway, we have a wonderful team, and we are here to help. Um, so if you have any interest in buying, selling, or even just uh, garnering some information, um, we are more than happy to help, meet, discuss. Uh, if your friends or family are also interested in buying or selling, please, please do think of us. Um, we pride ourselves on, uh, on the relationship, uh, and also we have a very long-term perspective, so we're not going anywhere. And again, I'd just like to thank you all very much for taking the time uh, to be on this webinar. And if you would like to ask any questions, please do so. Just remember that little box, uh, the Q&A, and uh, I can uh, answer whatever questions you may have. So, hello everyone, um, Mabel here. I'm going to read out a few questions that we've received from some of you. And um, the first one would be uh, to James. And they would like to know how many pre-sales on the Pageant Beach project? And then when would you expect that project to be completed? Okay, all right. So, the uh, Pageant Beach project is the uh, Grand Hyatt project. Okay, and they are currently heading towards 50% sold, all right? Very close to 50% sold. As far as when is that can be delivered, um, you're realistically, you're looking at from now, it should be less than three years. It shouldn't take any longer than about 30 months. I hope that answers your questions. Awesome, thank you. We've got a few more. So what is the 2021 winter season looking like in terms of hotel bookings real estate inquiries, and your sales expectations? Okay, excellent question. All right, so a um, little bit of a crystal ball, I guess. <laughs> but um, no, I think the truth is the, the number of people and even the bookings prior, what, what, what we've seen is that no one was canceling their bookings until as they really came up on them and realized that they couldn't make it for whatever reason, whether it was the fact that the borders were closed. So... I think you're going to find that what will happen is as we get closer and closer to the end of the year, that there are more and more reasons as to why people will want to travel. So I see us as having a very busy new year. Um, now, this is all subject to obviously being able to open up in a way that uh, really um, you know, keeps the suppression of the COVID down um, ultimately. But I, I feel we can do it. Um, it's just about doing it in a safe fashion. Um, and yes, we have a number of, of buyers and also existing residents who own here who are constantly checking with us as to when things do open up because they do want to come. And there are a lot of people who are very excited to get back here. Um, so I think it's very, very positive in that respect. As far as 21 and what that season looks like from a real estate uh, perspective, um, all things equal, looking at the way things are going, I see it as being a strong one. Um, I see us again as being on the beach in particular, probably lacking in inventory um, to a degree. Um, but I, I definitely think that the marketplace uh, 21 should be active. Um, I think there'll be some other things that happen. I, I'm, I'm hoping that some of the stuff that I've talked about with going east is gonna happen. So other areas around the island will open up to a degree and uh, hopefully in that year, they would have actually started on that main artillery road that uh, goes from uh, the, the Northwood, uh, not Northwood, sorry, uh, the North Sound Road and moves out towards um, beyond Bodden Town and out to Frank Sound because that, that would be a really great thing to open up the rest of the island over there. Awesome. Thank you for that. We have a couple of more. And uh, this one is, are there any restrictions for foreigners to purchase property? Does it allow for citizenship if you purchase a million dollar property? Does Team Bovell help navigate this for me? Ah, well the answer is yes. 
Um, I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about Cayman. Uh, if you buy property here, you will automatically satisfy one of the conditions of residency. The res residency here doesn't impact your status anywhere else um, either. Um, and there are different types of residency that you can get, whether it's a 25 year certificate or if it's something more substantial than that. It really depends on the investment you make, 750,000 up to two and a half million. Um, uh, the different cutoffs, but also as far as the, the type of residency that you would receive. If you were to invest uh, two and a half million dollars US uh, in a property, then that would actually give you rights um, in time to actually get status and become Caymanian as well. Um, so there are definite opportunities there. Um, I've always encouraged people when they buy property in Cayman to, to get their residency because ultimately it doesn't impact their, their, their existing um, citizenship or anything, but it does mean that they have a backup plan, they have a second home, they can come and go freely, they can feel part of the community as well. Uh, but there are some costs associated and it is a process that you need to go through. Um, as far as us helping you through the process, absolutely. We'll put you in touch with the best people who can help with this. Uh, that is not a problem. And yes, we would be along with you, uh, advising you and, uh, and assisting in any way that we can. Awesome. Okay, a couple more. Um, can you touch on the benefits of buying versus renting? for professionals on short-term assignments in Grand Cayman, say under three years? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, historically, what I've always said is, I've always said that the cutoff point is three years. Um, you know, because when you look at the cost to get in and the cost to get out, you know, you're looking at effectively needing to have an appreciation of in excess of 15% uh, through that period of time to justify going into a property. Um, obviously, with the likes of the last few years, I would say that that's very, very lightly. Um, the other thing that someone should keep in mind if they're thinking that way is that, you know, is it that you've got a hard fast that you're definitely leaving it at the end of three years? Or is it that if you like it and you might stay on because that's where uh, a lot of people kind of get hurt. They think, oh, you know what, I'm just going to go for two years. And so they come in, they, they, they rent a place, and they're renting, and they fall in love. And 10 years later, they're still here, but they haven't purchased. So you really want to make sure you understand your timeline. Um, obviously, buying the right property to make sure that you will have the appreciation. Then at least that way, when you did leave, and you did sell your property, you could actually leave and having built some equity rather than paid it out in rent. Um, the rental rates right now are a little soft, obviously, with COVID, and a lot of people have left the island. Uh, and so that's obviously impacted some of the rental rates, but not all of them. This is the, the, the funny thing, right? It's that, you know, uh, the primary area where the rental market's been hit is really more the sub-2,000 range. You know, when you start going sort of 2500 to $4,000 in, in rent, uh, those types of properties have generally been occupied and haven't had to you know, necessarily discount their rates or even loss of tenancy. Uh, predominantly, those are going to be more professional people, so they've still been able to retain their jobs, they still have a good future, and so that area has stayed stable. So I guess what is the nutshell of that <laughs> is just knowing the timeline, number one, understanding the cost to get in and the cost to get out, uh, and then really looking at the equity you can build over time. Great advice, thank you. Um, can you tell us anything about the new Mandarin project? Um, have you heard if that's going on or any updates? Yeah, okay, the Mandarin project is, um, <clears throat> is actually on the, in Beach Bay area. Um, that one they've gone uh, before planning um, to get the final approvals. Uh, and uh, at this stage, it, it sounds like they're still gonna have some challenges just getting through um, final approval, as I believe that uh, it's supposed to be going to the appeals uh, appeals process. Um, but yeah, I mean, effectively what you have is you, you have a, a hotel that's uh, very close to a residential community at the end of the day, uh, and uh, that hotel is, is quite tall. So it's, it's definitely having uh, some negative uh, impact as far as the community around it, but, um, it's, uh, 
they, they've got a challenge. But uh, at the end of the day, um, I can't answer whether it would definitely go ahead or not. But the truth is, a brand like that is actually a really great brand to have in King um, because we don't really have uh, any of the brands uh, that are generally from <clears throat> the uh, Asian Pacific area. And uh, those brands are quality brands and also can bring a very, uh, a really nice client base as well with them. Okay, this is our last question, um, and it's it's an interesting one. It's one I haven't heard of. Um, what do you make of Barbados and Bermuda's recent enticements to non-residents to live and work in their respective islands for a period up to one year? Is this something that Cayman should copy, and would it have a real effect on the property market longer term, for example, beyond the majority of them renting a property for a year? Okay. This is an excellent one, and uh, I, I obviously I've, I've read the articles uh, and I'm aware of it. Um, my concern is more about logistics and just understanding what it takes. Um, you're, you're talking about uh, it's one thing if it's a single individual, right, to be able to get up, pack their bags, and take a year out and work remotely. It's a whole different story when you turn around and talk about family relocating and moving to somewhere for one year. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a really difficult thing. So in my mind, I, I think they, get, they might get a few people taking them up on it and doing it, but ultimately I don't think it's gonna create a whole, of, you know, a whole amount of activity. I think what we have to offer is the sum of everything as to why someone should choose Cayman uh, to go and live uh, on a permanent basis. You know, a one-year teaser, I, I, I think if you're making that move, it's a much bigger deal than being able to just pack up and go for a year. Um, yeah. That makes no, sense. I don't necessarily think Cayman should, uh, should be going that way. I think there are other things uh, that are similar ilk where uh, they can help the process for people uh, getting their residency application so that the process there is maybe quicker. I can see it about having it where they incentivize uh, people uh, to buying property by maybe um, giving a discount on the costs associated with residency. And I see all sorts of other things kind of more in those ilks to kind of stimulate and encourage people to come and making it easier for them to come. I think that's probably the, the, the biggest one. But uh, until our borders are open, um, it makes it uh, quite difficult to push that. Awesome. Well, we have one more. Um, I just want to say further to that last question you answered, I'm really glad I'm here. So there you go. So um, this, Jim, <laughs> this uh, person would like to know if you can touch on the progress made to improve domestic internet speeds and costs which trad traditionally have been overpriced and a little too slow. <laughs> <It's> I, <quite laughs> funny. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. It, it, I, the reason why I laugh is just that, that um, I, I'm, I'm close to one of the, the providers, but the truth is that um, that you're right. I mean, Cayman is the second most expensive place for uh, internet in the Caribbean, um, you know, for 100 megs. And we're up to five times more expensive than other places in the Caribbean. Uh, and the truth is, there's really no need for it. Um, it can be reduced. Um, there, uh, we do need to get another pipe um, on and off the island. So they are working and uh, discussing doing another submariner cable. Um, which I think is really critical for backup purposes, but also just sheer bandwidth. Um, because going forward, we're just going to need more and more bandwidth. Um, so yes, I do think the pricing can be, get better. I think the bandwidth can get better as well. Uh, I think these are two things that are, um, well, I would like to think are very close to happening, especially from a, from a more competitive pricing standpoint. I think that's something that uh, should be able to be dealt with in the shorter term. Uh, and also the, the amount of bandwidth, because now it's quite common for people to run with 100 megabytes at, at home. Um, but, you know, the demand for this is just immense, immense. You know. Okay, we have another question. Seems like you're on a roll. Uh, what effect does the U.S. presidential election have on real estate in Cayman? <laughs> Okay, these are great questions. All right, um, 
You know, historically, I would have said that the U.S. elections had had more impact on Cayman um, for for very specific reasons. Like, for example, if the Republicans were in, then it was good for Cayman. If the Democrats were in, it wasn't so good for Cayman. You know, because they were, you know, the Republicans were more about yes, okay, tax planning is fine. You know, the, the Democrats no, they want to stop that. So. You know, it was that kind of attitude, and you could actually see it. In the, uh, you know what happened through those periods of time, and then what happened was a number of uh, well, a couple of elections ago. Basically, what happened was that um, what I ran into were a lot of people that were sitting in front of me, and what they were saying is, you know what, we don't actually mind paying our taxes, but what we have a problem with is how the money is spent. So it got to the point where they were pushing their people out of their country. Uh, because of some of their own political uh, directions and aspirations. And so that was something that did impact us heavily um, uh, historically. Now, not so much. Um, I think people come here for a number of reasons. Um, safety. I mean, think about safety. You know, people are feeling more and more uh, unsecure, uh, for example, you know, to the north of us. Um, you know, with, with uh, the challenges that they, you know, had recently over there. So all of these things, you know, they do, they, they, you know, it's not one thing, but you start adding up a number of things. And so it kind of people start looking as to where they can go and why they would go there. You know, but likewise, Cayman also needs to be very conscious of this as well, because, you know, ultimately we need to manage that as well. Like we can't be pushing people out. We can't be, you know, treating people in this way or that way that, could have an adverse effect on our growth and our continued enjoyment of what we've had. So, you know, we need to look objectively at this. As far as the current U.S. elections and stuff, how does that impact Cayman? Um, I, I, I would find it hard to say that it was anything other than, than was going to help us um, because I think more just because of volatility in security uh, the unknown, and so I see that being a, a, a driver for us. But this election is just one that uh, I, I don't think anyone could have predicted just because of the, the COVID aspect that's associated with it and how this is all being leveraged. Um, so yeah, I, I, I see us doing well, actually, from this. Um, that's the blunt, honest, honest answer. That's awesome. I guess we'll all be glued to our TVs on November 2nd. Um, well, that's all the questions we have for today. Okie dokie. I thank Brilliant. you for answering them. No worries. Thanks, thank for your help. And uh, I just also want to thank my team for being absolutely awesome. Uh, there's, a, there's a person in behind the scenes, Julia, who helps out with uh, our marketing and everything. is absolutely wonderful as well. So I definitely want to thank everyone for being here, for the help that I've had in putting this on. I hope it's beneficial to you. If you have any questions again, uh, or any, uh, or if you're interested, obviously in buying or selling, I mean, we're here to help. So please, please uh, just reach out to us and have a wonderful rest of the week. All the best.